But really quick, before we start this episode, down below in the description, you can subscribe to the brand new Iced Coffee Hour Clips channels. We're also going to be posting some fun behind the scenes and exclusive content on there. So make sure, if you haven't done it already, down below in the description, subscribe. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the 56th ever episode of the Ice Coffee Hour podcast. My name is NS Yumaza, and so far, channel has made $68,718.74. We did it. Wow. Jack, was that the best one yet? Dare I say it? I Dare think I, say it? I think that was the best introduction we've ever had on the Ice Coffee well, Hour. Well, thank you guys so much. Here's your phone. Thank you, Thank you, you so much. Yeah, really, thank you so much for driving all the way to Las Vegas so we could do this today. Now, for those that are not aware, you have a YouTube channel where you tour the most expensive, luxury, ultra high net worth houses in the planet. Pretty much. You see the best of the best. Now you're touring like hundred million dollar boats. You're getting to see what it's like to be ultra rich, to have hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and get an inside look into how these people live and how they spend their money. And your YouTube channel is getting very close to, by the way, a million subscribers. So we're going to link your channel down below in the description because I got to say your home tour videos are absolutely incredible. It's like it's watching like a cinematic movie of like this $75 million house. Thank you. Thank you, man. We work really hard and uh, yeah, we were very fortunate to be able to tour these homes. How did you get into this? Um, you actually know the part of the story. I know the story, but they don't know the story. Uh, I'll give a quick recap. So two and a half years ago, I moved to LA. I used to flip homes in Texas. Uh, prior to that, I was a student at Texas A&M. Uh, I was an athlete back then. So I graduated there, got into flipping, kind of like investing in real estate around 2015, 2016 heavily. Flipped about 30, 40 homes uh, back in Texas. And after that, I was like, you have money, you know, you always wanted to move to LA. Why don't you just take the leap of faith and just move there? And initially, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do in LA. I was like, maybe I develop properties. Maybe I learned the real estate market a little bit. So two and a half years ago, I moved to LA, got my real estate license and got into the business. And the way I grew the business was really simple. I actually took your course, real mm -hmm. estate course. It's awesome. And both courses, by the way, both courses, real estate and YouTube. I mean, uh, link down below in the description. Actually, now that I think, yeah. uh, just speaking out loud, you had a huge influence on how I kind of build my business in general. And three months in, going to Brokers Open, mm -hmm. uh, seeing the homes, and you know me coming from a contracting background, I was like, why nobody's talking about these homes? Uh, and we have Mikey right around the corner. I called Mikey probably two to three months being into real estate agent. I was like, Mikey, I don't, I'm not making any money. I don't know much, you know, I don't know many people here, but these brokers opens are amazing. Why don't you move to LA? You can sleep on my couch and on like the side, we'll start shooting some videos. And I watched your um, YouTube Academy. Mm -hmm. I was like, seems simple enough. And we just started shooting homes and here we are. Explain that more. You yeah. didn't just start shooting fair homes enough. and then we're here. Fair and enough. then you woke up one morning, a million subscribers. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So how did this happen? We started shooting and it sucked at the beginning. I mean, it was like we were getting like 100 to 200 views. We were basically touring brokers open. And I remember, wait, was this with your GoPro or yeah. what? You were touring with a GoPro. I remember watching your early videos when we first you first reached out. And we'll talk about that in a second because that's a crazy story. Yeah. Watching these videos. And yeah, it's just a GoPro. Just kind of walking around these like five to ten million dollar houses in Beverly Hills or Bel Air. That's it. Really, no commentary. You see people like getting out of your way as yeah. you're walking around. The houses are packed. You know why we were using GoPro? Number one, obviously, it was easy to use. Number two, we were so small, nobody knew us. We were yeah. kind of embarrassed almost yes. what we were doing. We were like, let's just use a GoPro. Let's just stay low key. Yeah. And me and Mikey were just touring these homes, getting sound bites. I was talking about details here and there. And I think maybe I could be wrong on this. We made like 12 to 15 videos, and we were at like 300 subscribers like it was a grind like it wasn't moving we weren't really getting any progress and uh i remember at that time we watched your academy probably twice at that point i was like we gotta find a way to meet graham now i haven't told you this but yeah i've emailed you before moving to la i've emailed you probably two to three weeks after moving to la uh -oh. and uh i've never heard back which now well, i yeah. truly yeah. don't blame you the amount of emails and dms we get hundreds hundreds it's per day 
It's, it's in mind boggling. It's impossible to we 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 will some we'll sort through all the titles, but even like the title we miss emails so so much. So we got to work on that. Now, like yeah. no hard feelings. Yeah. Like I totally get it. And then um, and then I saw this uh, listing that hit the market, and you were either a co listing agent or you were a listing agent on yeah. it. I told Mikey about it. I was like, Mikey. Graham listed a property because at the time it was hard to find you. You weren't really fully into real estate. This was like probably a little less than two years ago. And then, uh, yeah, this is just, by the way, as I was phasing out, yeah, I, was, yeah, yeah. I was focusing more time on YouTube and a client called me from YouTube, believe it or not, okay. saw my YouTube video and said, uh, I forget how she reached out. I think she found one of, one of my other email addresses, reached out to me saying that she had a five and a half million dollar home in West Hollywood. Okay. And I was scaling back, but this was like right up the street from my office. I spoke with Jason to make Good sure. Good listing. Yeah, it was a great listing. Um, right up the street from the office, five and a half million dollars, view of the entire city. And Jason said, listen, don't worry about it. If you're not able to make a showing, I'll make the showing. So, uh, so we were able to make it work, but that's that's how I got the listing is from YouTube. There you go. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I remember seeing the listing. I was like, Mikey Graham's listing a property. And then I saw the brokers open. I was like, Graham is going to be there. <laughs> uh, Mikey was like, ah, you know, we, we reached out to him. He never got back. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't like push this any more further. I was like, I don't want to hesitate this. Let's just go. So we literally came to that open house just to see you. And I remember it really well because after meeting you, Mikey was like, you came in really hot. Like you were like, hey guys, welcome to my listing. I was like, we're not here for your listing. We just came to meet you. <laughs> like I almost came off uh, too bold, but mm -hmm. uh that was the time we met you yeah. and you gave us like some really good advice. I remember so well. I we think I was editing, by the way, in that open house. <laughs> I had my computer open because it was a slow open house. Yeah. Because what what happens in Los Angeles is that when you list a house like that, the first weekend is packed. All the agents and people go and see the brand new listing. After the first week, it really settles down. So you really have that beginning, uh, the momentum. I think yeah. you came in like the second or third week, I think. Possible. On a Sunday. It was a slow Sunday. I was editing. Yeah, I possible. You guys in. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, I remember one of the first things, I'm sure Mikey remembers it too. We were doing like vlog number 11, 12. You're we like, no one cares. No one cares about the number. He's yeah, like, no. title these videos. I was like, wait, wait, what? Like, no one cares? Like, what do you mean? Like, I couldn't even comprehend what that meant yeah. at the time. We were so, like, I guess not educated enough about YouTube and platform. But that's how we kind of met you for the first time. Yeah. And you had 300 subscribers back then. Yeah. And from there, your channel started to grow and develop mm -hmm. and you started to get more bold with touring some of these houses. When did you leave the GoPro and start going with like a nicer camera? I would say after meeting you, kind of me and Mikey sitting on this thing for a couple of months at that time, I think a couple of things started to click and I just kind of started to look at the videos as like a whole. I'm like, you know, we're not clear what we're doing. No one knows who we are. So let's make it simpler. Let's make it about just one home, right? Start to finish. And then from there, listening feedback of the viewers, kind of understanding why they comment the way they comment, optimizing it. And I feel like four to five months later, me and Mikey's gears were like shifting in the right way. And then from there, we we're like, let's use a better camera. Let's use a better lens. Let's be a little bit more careful on how we walk these homes. Let's get a little bit better listings. And one of our GoPro videos, it was like this $49 million home in Bel Air. One morning, I can't remember the exact number, but uh, me and Mikey woke up. We were like, are you seeing what's happening? We got like 10,000 views. And then that video just went viral. Uh, had like, I can't remember the numbers, but like it was a lot of views for the time. So that was the first relief of we can do this. Like it's possible. And from there, we just articul articulated our thoughts, make better videos, brought in like Sony cameras, brought in more help. And the channel just kind of grew. Did you ever get any agents complaining about the, that GoPro footage, like you touring their house without their permission? Like the Bel Air house. I would imagine the listing agent eventually gets wind of this. Hey, we see this video. I didn't know you were filming. Take the video down. Every single one of those homes, we actually ask the agents. We're like, we're shooting this small GoPro vlog. Are you okay with it? Because no one knows us. They're like, yeah, sure, whatever. Do whatever you want. And we're actually really good friends now with the listing agent of that property. Really? In fact, he's also, his name is Marco Nagar. Okay. He's with Aaron Kerman's team. Sure. And Aaron we, Kerman is awesome, by the yeah, way. I have he, to say. Yeah, he gets, Nothing but a, Aaron Kerman is like one of the Los Angeles best agents. Yeah, he's yeah. big, without a doubt. Yeah. And uh, Marco was the listing agent on a $110 million ranch that we shot recently. So mm. we're actually really good friends with him now.
That's so cool. And then you reached out to me again, I think, when you had, what was it, like... 40, 50,000 subscribers. 40, 50,000 yeah. subscribers. And we met at a, uh, like, a coffee shop, got avocado toast... That's right. ...and talked about strategy to grow the channel. And it's incredible to see how it's grown from there. And the properties that you're able to get access to right now are truly one of a kind. So what's something that, that when people see these houses... Mm -hmm. like, what's it like for you, by the way, to walk through a house It's like... $50 million or $65 million. What stands out? But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Ladder. Recently, I've been looking to buy a new home in Las Vegas so I can finally move out of Graham's. I'm just so tired of Graham bursting in my room and asking me to smash the like button on all of his videos every time he posts. Ideally, I'd love an amazing view of the mountains so I can really enjoy what life has to offer. And of course, I would love for it to have a decent-sized garage and a pool that I would actually heat. <coughs> Graham. And most importantly, a nice trophy case for my biggest paper hands awards. And this absolutely awesome experience of searching for my first ever home serves as a reminder of how beautiful life is and exactly why it should be protected. On that note, it makes sense why people get life insurance, especially term coverage, which is surprisingly affordable. Why not pay a little bit each month to protect the ones that you love? Ladder makes it impressively fast and easy to get covered. You just need a few minutes, a phone, or a laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time, so you'll find out instantly if you're approved. And there are no hidden fees, and you can cancel at any time. And since life insurance costs more as you age, now is the perfect time to cross it off your list. So check out Ladder today and see if you're instantly approved. Go to ladderlife.com slash iced coffee. That's ladder, L-A-D-D-E-R, life.com slash iced coffee. Ladderlife.com slash iced coffee. Thank you so much, Ladder, for sponsoring this episode and back to the podcast. So like at this point, both myself and the whole team, Mikey, we are kind of really trained. We are almost like, okay, we go in, what do we talk about? Um, it's almost hard for me to be really, really impressed because I've seen so many good homes, right? But we're at a po price point now, like every home we tour is actually somewhat different. You know, when you start touring homes at like 40, 50 million dollars, you have to make them different. That's what people are looking to see. You know, you cannot kind of copy the formula that all the developers are copying. Um, generally, the things that I look for are just like, scale proportions i'm really big in sizes of rooms like if you cannot get your proportions right i feel like houses always sits weird i always look at the architectural details how an architect designed the home how it takes advantage of the view corridors how well the lot is utilized as you know a lot of the homes in la are hillside so it's always kind of amazing to see how they utilize these properties and make the best out of them and uh, i you know we really look forward to travel outside of california and outside of the country to really see different stuff. Yeah. What's been your favorite house? Like what what features to you is like shocks you? Um, we haven't released this video yet, but uh, a few days ago we shot this home in Hollywood Hills. We were actually reached out by the owner because owner was a really good friend of a, another friend of ours who's a developer. And he was like, you have to let these guys shoot your home. And it's this beautiful modern architecture right on uh, Collingwood. And it's a stunning property, $54,950,000. It has these bifold shades that automatically retracts to the roof. So you can put these metal shades up front. It's like sits on a, a promontory. The whole house was just sick. Like, I w I'm so impressed with that house. Without a doubt, that's my favorite home here in LA. And uh, hopefully that episode will be out in like by like mid-June. What's the most unusual feature you've seen in a house? Like this one weird thing that we saw, I was like, oh, that's interesting. We saw this guy install a black toilet that lifts up like a Lambo door and he had black uh, toilet paper. I was like, there's How? black toilet paper? I, I thought it was cool. I was like, that's interesting. Wow. It seems impractical it though, does. to have black toilet paper. Yeah. Hmm. But I mean, like it, talking about attention to detail, I was like, good for you. Like, that's kind of awesome. Um, a lot of these drop down TVs, hidden features, honestly, that house, again, we haven't released that video, but it has these like bifold shades, like metal shades that sits outside of the home. It's like a railing that protects the home. And with a click of a button, it bifolds and like stacks to the roof and sits like a cantilever. Actually, this guy was like obsessed with, uh, utilizing the outdoor spaces. He puts space heaters everywhere that comes down from cantilevers and motorizes down. So it's like sits two feet above you. So I thought that house probably has some of the coolest features. Going and uh, seeing all of these 40, 50 million dollar homes. Is that something that you would want to achieve at some point in your life? And if so, which home that you've toured is the home that you would prefer to live in? Like your favorite home for you to, to live in. So I have a confession to make. Uh, 
I used to be really, really inspired by these homes in terms of like, oh, I would love to live in one of these. And don't get me wrong, they're amazing. But they're so big. They're so expensive. And when you think about the running costs, the utilities, and like the overall liability of owning a home like that and kind of the stress it causes on you, I'm not going to lie, and I'm almost a little bit turned off on having these kind of luxuries. Like I would almost want like a two-bedroom house in Hollywood Hills. That's simple. Mm. That gets a good view and has an open living room. That'd be good enough for me. It's something about these really mega mansions. It's just, it's kind of overwhelming. It's a lot of people don't know this. Like, it's amazing to see them. It's amazing to hang out in them and all that. Would I want to have them as my home and spend like, I don't know, like a million bucks a year on property taxes? It's a bit insane. So, yeah. So which home that you've toured is the home that you'd prefer to live in? It would be this, this again, same home or Forest Knoll. You know Forest Knoll, that home with three different uh, can- barns, uh, barn roofs. Yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Those are my two favorite homes in LA. One of them is Viewpoint. Uh, I think it's $28 million now. It's one of our popular videos. It has like two and a half million views, I believe. Uh, that home and the last home we toured, those would be my two favorite. What are the owners like of these properties? Can you talk, can you talk about like, because I feel like once... Cause, to buy a house, it's, it's fifty million dollars. Most likely, they're worth anywhere between, I would say, a hundred billion on the very low end mm-hmm. to probably realistically about five hundred million to a billion. Uh, what are they like? So it's interesting. Every single one of them, like, it's like different personalities. Some, a lot of times, we deal with developers. They're kind of like it's an investment for them. It's a risk. Um, Every once in a while, we meet these owners with such unique backgrounds. Like, I won't give the exact names, but one of them was a film producer, and he's also an investment banker. The other one is like, uh, uh, which we are going to release a video. He's a developer from Russia, and he used to be in a bachelor's uh, like of Russia. He's really famous in actually Ukraine and Russia, and he develops these like sick homes in Hidden Hills, Hollywood Hills. He's a totally different personality. Um, like, Sometimes we tour these development companies uh, listings that are like big firms like with like 50 other investment. It really depends a lot of the times we either deal with the realtors or the developers because a lot of the homes we try to avoid touring homes that has personal furniture just for liability and we don't want to expose their like personal life. So a lot of the homes we tour are like staged, all polished up. So we end up dealing with, for the most part, uh, with developers. Have you ever filmed and like released a video and then after the fact, you know, either w- let's say like the, the buyer or something wanted you to take the, the video down and you had to remove it? Happened a couple of times and we try to honor it. And that's from a point of view of uh, like we shot it, we own that content. It's more so, I mean, I don't want to have the feeling of like knowing that someone is living in that house and they're uncomfortable to have the video up. It's just like, I don't want to put that kind of karma out on our channel and just it's personally not worth it for us. We just kind of like, fine. Like, that's why like we try to not showcase the home from exterior that much on the street level and like kind of keep it private because we want to keep these episodes. They're super hard to make. We spend so much time. I mean, it's mind boggling the amount of hours we put into making one video. So we try to take uh, keep them. But if we have to take them out, we take them out. Yeah, there's one video that Jack and I did a while back where we traveled to go and tour this house. And shortly afterwards, she sold the house and mm-hmm. wanted the video down. And we know that by taking a video down, it affects the algorithm. And by removing, even if, even if it doesn't get any views, by removing an old video, it tends to drop the entire channel. And my concern was that by removing this video, this could potentially cost us tens of thousands of dollars, uh, potentially even a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars over the course of you know who knows how long if this drops our views from removing a video. Mm-hmm. So we ultimately were able to work it out where we kept the video up, but that became a major concern for us moving forward with house tours. Is that if someone buys the house, they don't want anything on there on the MLS, especially in that price point, it becomes a tough one. It is a tough one. It's one of those challenges um, we deal on a daily basis, and I just kind of look at it as like. It's another difficulty that most people would struggle to deal with, and we'll figure out a way to do it. Mm -hmm. What was the most expensive home you've been through? $110 million, Santa Barbara, 3,600 acre ranch with like three mega homes plus like 10 other like uh, staff homes. It it took us three days to shoot this property. Yeah, we almost died trying to make this video happen. Like it's a 49 minute video. 
and we are a little bit reserved and i like that about us like meaning we don't really expose what we do that much we kind of stay quiet and we just focus on our work that video almost killed us like the amount of work that we put in shooting we were shooting like 12 hours a day for three days we had a car from beverly hills come in they were so separated from each other so we all had to work remotely um it was a huge challenge and we made it happen it has like 1.1 million views, I believe, in like 30 days. Who reached out to you for that? Was it the owner, agent, or developer? Agent reached out to us okay. to kind of discuss the idea. And you can imagine when someone gives you a $110 million asset, it's a big responsibility. And there were so many things to talk about that house. I was almost exhausted trying to remember everything about it because these owners are counting on me to make sure we highlight these features, you know? There's a lot of pride and uh, owner, you know, pride and ownership goes into a $110 million home. So that was just a lot of pressure, but the agent reached out and we kind of put this plan together. We're like, this is how we can shoot it because it's such an overwhelming pro uh, property to show in person. Each showing is like six hours. So we were like, how can we make this a video where someone can watch it for 40 minutes and really understand the fundamentals about the property and if they're interested, they can go see it. We almost wanted to create like a virtual link for the real estate agent. So even with so much plan, it still ended up being like 50 minutes. Yeah, It was insane. It's funny you mentioned a six hour showing. There was, uh, what was the, the property? Uh, I'm blanking on the name. It, it was on the market 250 million. Uh, like Bruce McCoskey's? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was explaining, cause he gave a tour to all of us at the Oppenheim group. Okay. And explained that every showing that they do was like fifteen thousand dollars just to bring in a buyer, because every time you go in, there are perfectly fresh flowers throughout the entire thing. Um, so everything, and and they don't keep them overnight. Yeah, like this is just for the time the buyer walks through. It's like fifteen grand, and the agent, by the way, was paying for this. So, and this this was a request of the owner. So really? every showing, yeah, they had they had to have fresh flowers. They also had to have, I think, the staff there to meet the prospective buyers so they could meet each other face to face. Uh, they also had, I think it was food, and they also had, I think, of Ace, Ace of Spades champagne. So by the time you walked up, you were given like the full treatment uh, and you were able to meet the staff. So just imagine like, uh, and oh, and he was even explaining, by the way, that they've had showings where they've been fully ready and the buyer cancels. Oh my like, god! Imagine that. Just the buyer, like last minute. Hey, sorry, can't make it. Honestly, fifteen grand is gone. I I totally get it, and it's, it's actually the right call because anybody spending money at that level, logic is off the table. It's yeah. it's fully riding on emotion. Like you go in there, you smell the house, you get the feeling. You're like, this is how I want to feel. I want to own this place. And whoever buys a hundred, two hundred million dollar home, it's an emotional purchase. I mean. It's a tough one to justify. It's just like, hey, I can afford it and I would like to have this house, so I'm just going to have it, you know? Yeah. So I think it's the right call and every showing is so important. Pretty much anybody that you get through the door at that price point, they're billionaires. Yeah. So, yeah, that to me was probably the craziest house I've ever seen. Not so much for for the, the price point, but mm -hmm. just because when you hear the story behind every little bit, every item, every corner has that a house story is crazy. behind it. Uh, like it was the uh, the the powder room sink was worth four hundred thousand dollars for just the sink in the guest bathroom because of like it came from a castle. Yeah. Um, every piece of art was like hand curated. They had onyx on the outside of the house that was just like you. Nobody puts onyx as as an exterior wall of the house. It's so expensive. It's, yeah, everything. Even the the movie theater, like the the equipment alone, was like a million dollars just for the equipment. It was, it was just insane. I mean, I feel like that home and the home next door to that in Bel Air, those were really experimental projects for Los Angeles. Even selling it at $88 million, I think broke like a new layer of like what's possible. I, the, my only two points on those two homes were, I think at that price point, people look for land and they seem to lack a little bit of land. I think especially Bruce's home was like, well executed in terms of like what kind of unique things you get in a home like that i just felt like they were not big enough in terms of properties and i don't care how cool your home is people at that price point look for land look for like 
they go in and they're like, this is my backyard. I can have thousand people here. And because they don't see these homes as just homes, they're like assets where you like leverage off to like yeah. get the right people through the door, that kind of stuff. What I've noticed though is that those buyers are sometimes the most like stringent when it comes to budgets. And they'll basically just in their mind walk through the home and be like, okay, that's a million, that's a million, that's a billion. And they'll come up with the cost of like how much it'll be to build that house. Yeah. Plus the cost of the land, plus the cost of carrying costs, plus the cost of the guy's time. They'll make an offer based on the profit they think the owner should be making. I've seen that that's true. so much. They're like, hey, listen, you're in this house. I'm just going to guess $60 million. Yep. You're, you're in this. Uh, okay, your time is worth you know $6 million a year. We're going to offer this. And that, you know, it, regardless of what the asking price is, that's what I've seen most of the time. And I don't blame them. I mean, every yeah. house we go back, it's not that hard for me to like roughly estimate how yeah. much they put in, you know, even if it's a hillside where engineering and foundation and caissons can be quite variable, it's not that difficult to calculate. So a lot of these people at that price point, they have resources or people, they can literally hire two engineers and a good contractor to be like, give me a rough estimate how much these people are in. Yeah, And they can just sit down, they can see the purchase price for the land, the time that they hold the property. I would like to think if I do a one to two day research, I can probably guess the cost of a property to a 95% accuracy. Yeah. So. Yeah, I remember too. Uh, Jason Oppenheim, had, uh, Jason Oppenheim had the listing. I think it was forty-four million dollars in Hollywood. Yeah, and the I guy know, it's on the hillside, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, the, house. and the guy spent, I think it was just over a million dollars removing the few power poles in front of the view. Welcome to LA. At like, I think it was a hundred or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars each to put the power pole underground. Yeah, in the Hollywood Hills. So that way, when you look at your view, you don't see a, a wire. Going across the city. That could be a $5 million swing yeah. on the sales price, having the pull versus not pull. So. I can't tell you how many homes I've sold in the 3 to $6 million price point where the reason they didn't buy the house was because right by the bedroom on that second floor, the third floor, you hear you. the bzzz, just this buzzing of the, this big power pole. And they feel like, oh, I don't want to be next to that. What if it gives off some sort of radiation? What... People just hate it. Yeah, I know. But it doesn't make sense. You can't remove it at that price because you never get your money back. But above like 30 million bucks, you gotta. people demand a higher caliber of home. Without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. I totally agree. You know, these luxury homes, they're they're a little overwhelming sometimes, but and it's it's almost interesting to me to see that like most of them sits empty. It's kind of because people that can afford these homes, they're so like wealthy that they probably are running big businesses. Yeah. They can't even enjoy it. Uh, we toured one home. Owner was like, he owned the home for two years. Um, this is not a joke. He's like, I've never swam in, in that pool. Me and Mike were like looking at each other. I was like, well, what? He's like, never I, swimming in the pool? Yeah. That reminds me of someone. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> so, yeah, I relate to the guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's Just that. on a smaller scale. Yep. Jeez. Yeah, uh, we've... I, I am always surprised at the level of um, just the wealth that's out there that yet yeah, these these houses just sit empty. They don't care. Uh, there was there's another property that we had a listing of. This is many years ago in Beverly Hills. I think that the property was anywhere from like fifth. It was over fifteen million dollars, and uh, the owner bought it, intended to move in, and just decided he wanted something else instead. That was it. Nothing wrong with the house. Just bought the house. And you know what? We actually saw something a little bit nicer. Bought the other house instead. Now, think the market went up. So we ended up selling it for a profit. So we bought this house, made money on it. But to buy a house like like that expensive and be like, oh, th this other house, I'm going to buy that instead. Just doesn't care. We toured another house and then like owners, pro I mean, they were technically living in it. They're like, yeah, their kid is going to uh, UCLA. So they bought this house. And it's like a $20 million yeah. home in Bel Air. I'm like, yes. what? You know, so... Um, that's the world we live in. Yeah, there was uh, uh, somebody I met at uh, at a car meet who was, uh, I think he was a little bit younger than me, but his family bought, it must have been a 20 to a $40 million house in Bel Air, mm -hmm. right by UCLA, because he was going to UCLA. And that was it. That was the only, and and, and their, their uh, logic behind it was, well, we'll be able to sell it for more money because it, it's, a, it's like a prime property. I actually, I don't know if I could say, I think I should be able to say, it, it was one of like the Walt Disney estates. In really? Bel Air, there, there's some sort of Disney estate that was there that they that they purchased wow. in Holmby Hills, but it has underground tunnels, by the way. 
That's crazy. They connect to like an adjacent property. It was wild. We recently yeah. toured the Godfather Estate. The oh yeah, Beverly Hills. Yeah, yeah ninety yeah, million dollars. That yeah. was a pretty crazy one. Uh, like they had a nightclub, they where they took Hugh Hefner's old nightclubs, like furnishings and all that. So they replicated the club after it was closed and brought all the furnishings to this home. So they have a nightclub that looks like exact. I think it was called Touch. Uh, it was Hugh Hefner's uh, Beverly Hills nightclub. So that was really interesting. Wow. What do you think of the one? <laughs> um, I mean, it's really big. <laughs> now, let's explain this. This is the most expensive property in, is it in the world? It's the world. It's no, it's not in the world. I've, I've seen the, the Antilia or oh, whatever. But Ant- that, but listen, but that's like a commercial apartment building. It's a home. house. It's, it's a, a home. It's, a, it's an apartment building. That You're buying a skyscraper. It's a home. You, listen, that's a skyscraper. <laughs> it's that's a, a it's skyscraper. A, what do you think? Do you think it's a home? Is that a house? You know the one it's like. It's yeah, 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 I know, I know. I mean, unfortunately, I would say it's technically a home. I mean, he's crazy enough to build it the way he did. I, I get it. Uh, I, it is a skyscraper. I feel like that's cheating. That, that's like, you know, I'm buying like a big Walmart. Be like, oh, I really? live in a... Yeah. I but once know. you're building a house so big, wouldn't Dude, it make pe- sense pe- to start building crazy. up? We were touring this uh, penthouse in New York, and during the uh, when we were shooting it, listing agents were showing it to someone else, someone's representative. They're like, yeah, they're interested in buying the top two floors and the bottom two floors and doing like a five-story penthouse. Each one of these penthouses were like 50 million bucks. Like, Are they just casually talking about dumping $200 million just so they can have like top five floors? People do that stuff. So I'm actually not that surprised about that home. I mean, people are crazy. Okay. So we'll call it a home. Yeah. Fine. Fine. He looks so happy. <laughs> of course he looks happy. <laughs> but, okay. So we'll call it, it's it's the second, one of the most, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think without a doubt, the land that it sits on has got to be one of the best pieces of property in the, you know, in Los Angeles, if not in the country. Yeah. Describe um, what makes it. Well, it's this really high promontory, but you know, a lot of times promontories are nice, but if they're set back and they're low, a lot of people look into it. So I don't like that. It sits high enough and kind of pulled back in Bel Air that is somewhat private considering the elevation. So I like that about it. Number two, um, it's just like he owns the whole hilltop. It's not just like he owns the edge of it, right? Like mm-hmm. you just go to the elevation and it's that property and that's it. Uh, in terms of the architecture, I mean, it's McLean. It's a good home. McLean is an amazing architect. You know, he does so many projects in LA. Where I would compliment on is, I mean, it's so big. You know, I'm really trying to understand who would be the end user and why it would make sense for them to have that much square footage. Uh, I'll be lying if I say I'm educated enough to understand and comprehend that. Um, we actually been in that property mm-hmm. about two, two and a half months ago. Me and Mikey went there to check it out. Uh, we went, uh, we met one of the project managers and to our side at the time, it, they were about 90% done. Uh, it wasn't fully finished already. I mean, it's a good home. It's a, it's a different take. It's kind of like that Bruce McCoskey home. Like it's a bold approach. And he sold it, you know, granted he started with 250 million. It ended up selling for 88. What would happen with this? I don't know. You know, you saw the Niles video. He has some bold perspective on that house. Maybe they would do something like that. I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a tough one for me to make a comment. Yeah. So they're asking 500 million for the record. Wait, I thought it was 250. No, No, they're like, I didn't they go down to like 380 maybe? Maybe 380. So they started with like $500 that. million. Dollars. Two, 250 was the other house that we were other talking house. about. The Bruce Mikowski house with the $400,000. It's on Bel Air Road. It's $400,000. 500 million for this house. It started at 500 million. Yeah. Lowered now. Uh, they're having a Memorial Day sale. <laughs> Just like we know what we should do a Memorial Day sale on the, on the YouTube Creator Academy. $200 off. And the mentorship group. Okay. Okay. Deal. Perfect. You deal. know what? Okay. How about this? Well, well, Jack and I will come up with a discount on the mentorship group and the YouTube Creator Academy. The YouTube Creator Academy, two hundred dollars off. I'll testify so, for that. It works. But okay. So anyway, so it's reduced to three eighty. And what do you what do you think it's going to sell for? I mean, you've seen probably more fifty plus million dollar houses than almost anybody I I would know. <sighs> That's a, such a tough question to answer. I would say maybe. Somewhere around fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred a square foot. That would bring it to one hundred sixty to like two ten to twenty ish maybe. And that's just a basic 
uh, appraisal of new construction pricing, right? The only issue is this house has 110,000 square feet of interior square footage. So that's a lot, but it's one of a kind. No one will ever be able to recreate it. I mean, there's like a whole story on like how we pulled the permit on that property where it was almost like overlooked by accident. So like he got approved by this mega home that no one can ever build. Like you can never recreate a home that size. And um, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen. Little, uh, uh, yeah, side tangent for that. When I first started selling real estate, this was Beverly Hills, 2008. They had just passed what's called a mansionization ordinance just passed it. And before this, you were you were you were given these like five to six thousand square foot lots where you were able to build a forty five hundred square foot house. Insane. Yeah. So basically imagine the entire lot is a huge mansion with a backyard like the size of like a little strip. Yeah. A little strip is a backyard. They Beverly Hills did not like that all of these houses were huge, huge, huge. Developers were maxing it out, so they passed a mansionization ordinance that says now you could only build. It was like sixty percent. It was like sixty percent plus fifteen hundred square feet. It was, it was or something like that. Forty percent plus fifteen hundred square feet of whatever the lot size is, and that was the selling point. Was that this is pre mansionization. You're getting a bigger house. You can't build this anymore. Yep. And so far, uh, they've only gotten more strict. They're scaling back on what you could build. Without it less not. square footage. Without so, yeah. So that's a good point there that you can't build that anymore. And I don't know what kind of commercial applications uh, they could have, but... I can't I, imagine I, anything up there well, in a can residential see like area. A, well, no. I can see maybe an embassy for UAE. I don't know. I'm just like yeah. thinking, you know, just wild thoughts. What's Yeah. What would the, like... Who would have to be the buyer of a, of a home like that? I mean, what would the net worth of that person have to be? My gut will tell me without a doubt it's going to be a foreigner yeah. and it's going to be maybe someone from Middle East, someone from Asia, yeah. because it's an easy asset to park a lot of money on. So like you can literally put $200 million in the ground in another country where they would have to go through different jurisdictions to be able to touch that asset. A lot of these people like to spread out their wealth. So they could literally be like, we can just dump $200 million there. It's 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 new. They wouldn't States. even live there. I doubt it. They would just want, have the staff like, maintain it. This would it. be there like they would go in for three days and they wouldn't be not there for like another six months kind of house. Yeah, Isn't I've seen so, yeah I've seen so many houses like that, uh, especially from especially from Asia. They want to bring money to the United States and park it anywhere they can. And in two thousand nine, two thousand nine and ten, they were buying up the majority of Beverly Hills. No. Every single property that uh, would come on the market. That, that uh, either either myself or someone in my team would list, we'd get an offer automatically. Just sight unseen. It was a low offer. So imagine if we list a place for five, they'll say we'll pay 3.8 right now, cash, sight unseen, no contingencies, sign the deal, it's done, we'll wire the money the next day. Yeah. They just didn't care. But they lowball everything. Most of the time they didn't get taken seriously, but they're doing this enough so that it's a numbers game. Like they, they make they 20 offers, they'll get one. Um, and there was a listing. Oh, geez, we had a listing on uh, Don. Uh, I think it was Don Hill Drive, Don Beverly Hills. Hill. And I, I think the listing at the time was like ten million bucks. They offered like six five or something like that. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I was like, just sound scene. But yeah, but and, oh, and then what's even crazier is that they would have these home tours. They would all go together as a group of investors, like fifteen to twenty, and rent a like a, a bus. And then go from property to property to property really? to property, lining up like thirty to forty homes over a weekend, and they would all be sitting there writing offers on on houses. They'd all as a That's as crazy. a group, as, uh, as group. an investment to let the house sit. Yep, and they would pretty much write an offer on everything, just at a price for them where there's enough upside. But I guarantee whatever they bought uh, back then has probably doubled or tripled. Double, the price. Yeah, they probably made yeah. money on it. Oh yeah, without a doubt, probably doubled or tripled. And if someone yeah. decides to buy this, like the one, they lose all privacy, right? Because like, there's no way that you can no, go undiscovered yes. if you're buying a property. Yes, like that. You, you can. So it's buying a property. I, th I think it's you. You buy it within like, uh, it's called a blind trust. So you're th there's a very complicated way of doing this where you buy it in an LLC held by a trust, mm -hmm. held by another trust with some like beneficiary being. Uh, a lawyer whose offices is, you know, in New York. That's what I saw. Yeah. yeah like anytime like celebrity doesn't want to show that they own the home, it's somehow their lawyer's name on the, on like the online yeah. website. That's what they're going to yeah. do probably for this property. Probably. Yeah. That's what I've seen done. 
uh, because we've represented a few celebrities that do exactly that. The LLC blind trust. Everyone signs NDAs. Yeah. Usually it slips. Usually because someone slips. What, what ends up happening is that the, some of these people are followed around. And so if they see a moving truck, um, like I, I won't mention who it is, but this one actress that I represented, she was moving. Can you say and, it and we'll bleep it out? Oh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. but she was moving. But they had the paparazzi see the moving truck, oh. and they followed the moving truck to the new house. Wait, but and how would they know it was that actress? Because they knew where she lived from neighbors. Maybe. Yeah. Dude, it's tough yeah. to oh, be a celebrity. And, and then here's the other thing, too, is they'll get mail records. You can't have anything in your name that gets sent to the property. Like, you think, oh, Wait, let me... Why? That's illegal to, to they, go through someone's mail. They, they have ins. They have ins. They know if if you even sign up for a magazine to go to the property with your name on it, a hundred percent that name gets sold and leaked. Yeah, you can't have anything. I didn't realize this, but yeah, utilities that's not in your name. Cable not in your name. Nothing is in your name. It's all done through a lawyer. Everything. Yeah. Yeah, and even and then even like you do everything perfectly, but then you know the neighbor. And the neighbor somehow tells somebody you tell somebody and Before they trace you know. it back to you. It, it's over. So, yeah, for that level of privacy, it would be really tough. Honestly, yeah, it's tough. And L.A. is not a cheap place. Even a lot of celebrities struggle to get that privacy Yeah, because it's just expensive. Yeah, and think of it, too. Let's say this, this house sells. All it takes is for a few people to park outside of the house and just sit there with cameras. Yeah. Guaranteed they'd be able to get a shot. Even if you're driving in and like, you know, a completely blacked out Escalade, Escalade. you'd be able to get a picture from the front or sometimes people are like uh, with drones and like you call the police, but like by then it's too late. All it takes is one telescope, figure out who it is, track it. I agree. Yeah. There's no way of true privacy like that. Yeah. It's nuts. It's tough. Everybody wants privacy, but it's tough to get it in LA yeah. unless you have a lot of money. Yeah. Wow. So, what do you think the land is worth of the one? Because he bought it for, I think, a blow up. What was it like? Eighteen million dollars? He Something bought it like, like that back in two thousand eleven. I mean, I can easily see it trading. Like you see, what I would have done is it's four acres. I would have built a thirty thousand square foot spec home, ask hundred twenty million, and it would have sold. Yeah. That's what I would have done. Yeah. I mean, that's like my automatic initial gut instinct. I would have had a sick backyard, just 150 feet pool, just all out with the outdoor space and let the outdoor space be the focus and priority rather than like this mega home. And uh, he would have he would have easily gone 120 on like a sick yeah. 30, 40 but thousand the, square foot. But the issue that I see with that is that the reason why developers build so much square footage, as you know, is it, it's cheap to add that extra few square feet the ones you're building it adding in that little extra bit isn't it yes high and ROI? No. yes and no yeah. like at a scale of like between twenty five thousand to thirty thousand sure but when you go 100 plus like the mass of weight that you hold there now your case sounds i feel like his oversize probably add up so much in the engineering now you have to run multiple breakers like it's not just like you have a little bit more it's like then you got to design the whole thing. Then you have flaws. You have now a huge roof that you want to make sure it doesn't leak and it's flat. I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. To me, like I said, for the price he's gone, I think it's a bargain. I can see that land trading for like 50 million easy right now, 60 million even, just the land alone. I would have just put a 35,000 square foot modern, yeah. you know, something timeless, get it beautifully designed, ask 150, 140. Yeah. You know what would do well is uh, just a very sustainable house up there. Like, honestly, if he could have designed something that was completely off the grid. Off the grid. Or, or you know, it's not like off the grid, but it could be. Yeah. If you want it to be off the grid, something something eco-friendly with a whole bunch of trees. Like, like really create like a forest because th- th- that doesn't S- exist. Something unique almost. Yeah. yeah. Spe- right. Speaking of which, the one house that I that I saw online recently is Ashton Kutcher's house. Have you seen it? Yeah, it's pretty cool. We got to throw up pictures of this. Yeah, it is in my opinion one of my favorite properties ever that I've ever seen. It's it's built as a barn. It's very it's cool. It's like a modern barn with privacy, surrounded by greenery and nature, and it's open. But it, but it's but it's contemporary. Like it feels like something that is built today, but. It has that charm of something that's like a hundred years old. I've never seen anything like it. I saw it too. I was like, oh, maybe we get lucky. We get a chance to tour it. But uh, no, it's a pretty nice home. Right. Without a doubt. So what do you think the developer's cost is on the one? (sighs) I want you to estimate. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Um, 
Uh, gosh. Because you know what? I'm going to write down a number. Yeah, 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 and then we'll compare. Yeah. Okay. So All right, then I'm going to guess. I'll guess too. I'll guess. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let's, don't, let's, we can't say any numbers here. So I have a number, and I have it on my phone. Okay. So who wants to? Jack, I want, I want you to go first, Jack. All right, $175 million is how much I think it costs to build the one. And we're talking about just cost cost of the property not the land just to Wait, build not the land as well i'm no. just saying all in like developers cost no we no just land is around 18 million so you can come up with like your exact number on how much do you think it costs? okay 157 then okay 157. 100, wait, wait, 157 is your cost to build the house that's yeah. what we're and, talking and about. Wait, the house, but what about like the trees and the grass and all of that? Well, that's included. That's, that's included. like that's improvements. Yeah. Yeah. Not the land. So, okay, so just that. Okay, 100, yes. 157 million. Okay. 55. 155? No, one just sorry, sorry, just 55 million. Oh, you think it's 55 million? Yeah. Without a doubt, at lowest he's at uh $900 a square foot, which would be about 95 million. I say this because it took over eight years, seven, eight years for this property to be built up. Just the carrying costs and being able to maintain the property up there, it should build up. Oh, we're not talking about carrying costs. So I did six hundred dollars oh, so, oh. a square foot. Mm-hmm. No, uh, six hundred dollars a square foot because of how much square footage there was. I'll be really curious if this yeah. information one day leaks. I would say without a doubt, minimum nine hundred dollars a square foot, ninety five million. I can see it as high as thirteen hundred dollars a foot. Hundred forty million. Now you've seen it. I've I've only seen the video yeah. of it. You know why? Yeah. Because it's just like not even like the finishes thing. But when scale changes, he has these huge marble walls. Those are full slabs. I have a feeling they got big cranes up there. The trees he got. Those are not just like brought by trucks. You know, like you add these little things up. That movie theater. That's not a just a movie theater. He must have spent ridiculous amount of money, and he has custom stuff in there. So. I would like You're to right. think the I'm movie pre- theater alone would be five, six million dollars. Exactly. Minimum. He has yeah. that like second floor roof. That means the whole thing is probably still cantilever. And I don't know. My gut tells me lowest 90 million, highest 140 for the construction cost, not the land. Wow. That's insane. So you don't think he's going to make much money on this considering how much time he's put in and how much he's spent? Because right now he's in foreclosure, right? He's behind. He's behind on there his has payment. Been, there has been that article, and I think like he actually talked about it in the video that producer Michael did, that uh, he's behind his payments. I honestly don't know, and it's one of those things that, uh, because I'm not involved in it, I don't want to make that many comments on it. Mm-hmm. I would like just to kind of stay out of it, but uh, it's just an interesting, bold take. You know, that's yeah. kind of all I have. How do you finance a home like that? Like to be able to borrow that much money? Investors. And partially bank but not all of it that's such a spec home that i have a feeling bank wouldn't finance at all it'd be like we'll throw in some what rate do you think the bank did finance it for him because he has a track record of building these these houses i thought a bank did i thought a bank is involved i don't know if they financed at all Hmm. yeah i have a feeling big chunk of it is probably the bank um but again, who knows? Yeah, you know what's funny? That, that saying where it's like, if you owe the bank a million dollars, that's your problem. If you owe the bank a hundred million dollars, that's their problem. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. True. And now and now Niall is the one who could call the shots. Because if, if if that property gets foreclosed, it's losing 30% in value. Like you can't foreclose on that house. Yeah. You, you, you have to work with him. You, you don't have a choice. Like you literally have to hire a few people to manage that foreclosure as an asset because it's so expensive. You're like... Imagine trying to figure out the electronics on that thing. Yeah. Out of the blue. It's 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 crazy. Yeah. So we should probably swing the conversation into like YouTube success. Okay. So what do you think set you apart from other, you know, YouTubers that tour these homes? Why did your channel blow up so quickly um, instead of theirs? So that's a the way I mean there's so many things to talk about that. But number one thing I would say is we really try to showcase these homes in a way that uh that honors the property, right? Like I want to make sure owners are happy with the end product. Developers are proud. And we, you know, I felt like a lot of these homes that are 20, 30 million in LA, people are like, these are just ridiculously priced. I'm like, well, nobody knows how to talk about them and they're not easy to develop. They take years to develop. Permitting process is insane. And some of these details look so simple, but they're not easy to execute on. So we just try to cover those things. And I think people appreciate understanding why they are $30 million, right? And we explain it from a point of view of like not being a realtor. Like it's like, 
hey, this is how it works. And let me explain it to you. So I don't like salesmanship. I'm not a good salesman. I don't think when I was a realtor, I was probably not the best realtor from a point of view. Like I wasn't pushy. I was like you. Mm-hmm. You weren't pushy either. You were like, hey, work with me if you like me. I'm kind of that way. No. And I think people like that. So, And on top of that, the whole production side of things. We really take pride in what we do. And I think we put mind-boggling amounts of hours in the videos. How many hours would you say each video takes? You're talking about like the post production side I'm of things. I'm just talking about hours, start to finish, in total, before even everyone. like getting the house. Yeah. yeah. From the time I see it and somehow I get introduced to the owner, or like I re- I reach out or they reach out to me, meeting, preparing for the house, planning, shooting, editing, it's got to be 120 to 140 hours. Per video, e- easily man hours, easily, and that's like between me, Mikey, and the rest of the team, like wow. easily. One video, and we do it every week. That's that's honestly the most challenging part of it, keeping the quality and raising the bar while maintaining this with the type of homes and the type of style we shoot them. This is the one of the most difficult puzzles yeah. we've ever had to put. Like it, I lose my hair over this every day. And you were bringing yeah. up all of your expenses, like like your equipment. Yeah, what are your expenses on this? I mean. For the production gear, we got to be probably around 100000 if not more. No. Yeah, two IMAX. Wow. Hard drive after hard drive, small hard drives, multiple uh, Sony cameras, audio equipment, shotgun mics, multiple drones, big drone. Uh, we have Inspire, memory cards, lenses. I, I believe our expensive drone, the lens set alone on that, the lens kit with like multiple lenses is like twelve grand. Wow. And you know what? I guarantee people are at home watching your video thinking, oh, that's easy. Look at that. Two cameras, walks through for an hour. Ah, done. Here, here's NS walking with his yeah. friend, acting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gets Look, to see cool houses all day. It, it is, uh, it's a big challenge that we put together. You know, where it becomes really difficult is with your videos or what you guys do. You guys can control the product, like the video core itself with us. The product that we make the video off of is someone else's. That's such a delicate balance to manage and be able to make the content around their product where they're on board and you still manage to pull off your vision on it. You know, we don't get the freedom that you guys have where you can take the conversation wherever you want. You can make fun of it or not. We can't. So it's a, it's a really difficult balance that um, we deal with every day. So how is it for you to see all of our equipment over here in our setup with our lights and our towel light diffusers. What do you think of all of this? Do you think it would be in our best interest to upgrade some of our equipment? Um, I feel like Jack is really putting Graham on a tough spot here. So here's where I'm at. Tell me a way to improve a content or whatever we were doing better. As long as I can get behind the cost of it, like... I will spend whatever money it takes. Like I literally were talking to Mike. I was like, you have a good idea that you can express to me and justify it. I'll invest half a million dollars tomorrow without a blink of an eye. I'll empty my stock account and I will just invest it. It's all about to me business. I take my emotions out. It's about, is this worth the investment? And it's not just from a money point of view. I look at things as, uh, as um, for example, we buy an equipment. How much time do we have to spend on this equipment? What kind of returns we're going to get? How our footage is going to improve? Is that worth it? Is that going to make our videos better where we get more views or like our overall quality is going to go up? If you can justify it to me, I will spend any money needed. I'm kind of, I'm bold. I, I, I take yeah. bold risks. See, I feel like there's diminishing returns. Like to go from no camera to an iPhone, boom, big, big upside there. Big upside. To go from an iPhone to a DSLR, boom, big upside. To go from a DSLR to 4K, okay, mm. maybe... Five percent to yeah. go from 4K to then getting all these fancy lights, maybe another few percent, better audio, you know, or, or, or to go from like a shotgun to a wireless mic. Yeah, that's going to do well. But to go from the wireless mic to a road, it, it starts tapering off in terms of what you could accomplish. And I think I at least feel for my videos, the real magic is in the planning and the story behind what I'm talking about mm-hmm. and less than like fancy equipment. And I, I love the homegrown nature of the channel. I started mm-hmm. in my garage making videos and I'm still kind of in a garage making videos. That That isn't changing. I like the fact that it's like, 
it's me doing it myself and it's not like some big corporation or anything. production so, team. So I like the fact that I'm using the same camera as I did four years gotcha. ago that I bought used on eBay because it was cheaper. I I feel like that just that that's the organic uh, nature of the content. And honestly, for you and what you guys are trying to do, I get it. For us, without a doubt, we want to become the most versatile and the best team in the world. Like I'll say this out loud in the world to shoot these homes globally and some of these other expensive assets. So for us to get to that level, if there's a way we can improve the content by 0.01%, you have my attention, let's talk. That's how I see it. So I'm brutal when it comes to this stuff. Where I kind of hold it back is I want it to be like, when whatever improvement we're doing, it needs to be practically applied or we need to have a plan in place to integrate just because a hundred thousand dollar camera is better. Yeah. But do we know how to shoot with that? Do we know how to process that? If you don't, that to me is actually not a good investment. Yeah. But you tell me how we can integrate that into our operation. I'll go by tomorrow. Oh, what was I about to say? Oh, do you ever worry about running out of houses or like not having one lined up for a week? Like how, how far in advance do you film these videos? Right now we do four to five week ahead. That's smart. Yeah. That's, that's the only way we can deal with the fluctuations because last minute it rains, last minute owner changes their mind. It's too much. I wish people can understand the amount of abuse and like stress we go through trying to produce these videos. And we're, we have a laid back personality, me and Mikey, um, where we're like kind of easy about this stuff, but uh, it's crazy of a logistics that we deal on the back end, putting these together, but we shoot in advance. I would like to say our second channel, we probably have always four to five videos in inventory. We yeah. may not be able to edit them right away, but we have them. We do the same thing mm -hmm. on ours. We always like to be a week ahead on the podcast. Yeah. I'm always one to two videos ahead at any given point on the, the main channel. Gotcha. We're always about one to three videos ahead on the second channel. Good. Um, and the, po the podcast is week by week. Gotcha. So that that's the most mm -hmm. up-to-date stuff. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, to us, in order to run it at the level we want, we need to be ahead. Uh, that's just the bottom line. Some of these agents reach out to me. They're like, can we have it by next week? I'm like, no. And that's just the price. Like, you want to be ahead with us? You need to let me know two months in advance, and I'll schedule it accordingly, and I'll, I'll book you a slot. What if they paid you? What if they said, hey, we want this video to be up next week. We'll give you $30,000. Can you can you make it? Will you? We, I yeah. could probably sweet talk the other owners and, like, push it. I, I may be able to make it work. Obviously, any, any pay helps to up our operation and all that. Um, but I tried to, like, I don't sell the services, meaning if you don't like it, I don't care how much they, they pay us. I won't say the name, but a big builder reached out to us and I wasn't feeling their property. They offered us a really good money. I was like, no chance. Can you tell us how much? Like, you don't have to say what it is, but... $12,000. And I was like, no chance. For one video? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Were they trying to sell the listing or what was... I don't like their product. And yeah, like I, I, okay. I, like, I can't go there and be like, their houses are great. Yeah. No chance. But from their perspective, did they hope that you would be like, this is an amazing house, here's how cool it is, it would get all these well, views, they, and they wanted us to do. Their... They wanted us to do exactly what we do, but I genuinely wasn't stoked about the house. So I, I turn down like 30 homes a week. If, if I don't like feel like my enthusiasm is not going to be there or it's a good representation of what we do, I politely say no. Mm -hmm. What percentage of, of sellers pay you to make the videos on their homes? Um decent amount and it really depends like if it's an easy video to make and if you're going to get a ton of views like i just know it's going to be no brainer uh we don't necessarily have to get paid or like i'm worried about getting paid but some of these videos are just expensive to produce i mean like it, our videos are nothing cheap to produce so then I, I will put a budget together or like this is how i can do this at a level that this property deserves like you cannot tour a uh 3600 acre ranch and produce it in one day like no chance you got to spend three days there you got to run the whole crew so i put budgets together based on the shoots where they are sometimes people want to fly us out i'll be like you got to cover all these and we got to have our fee in there and that's how it makes sense for us to stop everything we're doing in la pack all this stuff come to where you're at shoot it and go back and edit it and deliver it at a timely fashion so can you can you share oh unless you have a question I'm oh i just wanted to talk about youtube revenue that's what I wanted to talk about. Oh, We're on the okay. same page. Can you, 
can you talk can you show about us your analytics? I can show the analytics, but right. in terms of revenue, we're like let's see, anywhere from uh, fifty to a hundred thousand on a good month. Um, considering for YouTube ad revenue, for YouTube ad revenue, considering the views we get, which is okay. We, wait, so I was I was gonna say uh, ninety. I was gonna say eighty. Really? Yeah. We're, we're I usually Jack and I are pretty close Jack, on this. Play with it. You you know how it works. Let me see it. All right. I'm gonna. Can I screen record? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so you have a million real time views, oh, okay. which is incredible, and it's super consistent. Your watch time, man, incredible watch. So I've 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 never seen watch time as high as yours. Really, one million well, six hundred fifty thousand hours of watch time. Last I'm honored. We're days. honored. That's, That's a big a compliment. Lot. The only thing I don't like, man. Your revenue should be double. Yeah, and I be. think that's just because you're not putting enough mid roll ads in the video. We don't want to. We don't want to upset the audience. We're we're like too gentle, you know. No, it's okay. It how many rude. how many mid rolls do you put in your videos? If it's like a thirty to thirty five minute video, we'll put like four or five, maybe five mid rolls and then a pre roll post roll. Yeah, and do you do non skippables? Yeah. Our CPMs are not that high, guys. Why are they so low? I don't know. I mean, we, we garner a big international audience. You know what's crazy? The average view duration. I have a feeling. The, it's weird. The average view duration you're getting is the same as our second channel, Jack. It's under 10 minutes for a 30-minute video. But I have a feeling it's because your videos get recommended so much. So much. That people click on it, watch a minute or two, click off. But those people that watch all the oh. way through... That they give you. It yeah. could be because his audience is not very heavily based in the United States. Yeah. It's like a wow. 25%. Dude, it's we a have a huge international. Oh, United States. Yeah. 20. Yeah. See, ours is about 80. No, it's like 80% US. I, I bet that plays a big role. Big role. Big yeah. role. India, 10% India. Love we, the Indian we, have people. A, we have a big Indian audience too on the main channel. A lot of people watch from India. Nope. Yeah, you know what? That's what it is. It's just your audience. Yeah. Is only 26%. I bet that 26% from the US. United Kingdom is great, but it's such a small percentage here. Yeah. yeah. 26% United States. That's probably driving 80% of yeah. your revenue. Yeah. It has up upside and downside. Upside, like I like that our audience is international that gives great exposure to these listings, you know? Um, but downside is CPM is low, but you know, we make it work and, uh, we are lucky enough to be able to cover our operations and run the team and keep everybody happy. So you have great <laughs> analytics. Thank you. Yeah. They're, they're coming, they're from, but, coming from you guys. But you it know means what? A lot. The, uh, you know why it's so Do you mind if I throw it? It's so consistent. Thank yeah. you. But you yeah. know why it's because every video is an evergreen video that you push. Yes. Correct. Every single thing you it doesn't matter when you watch it. Like with yeah. our videos, they usually die after a few days because like nobody cares about what happened to the stock market on a Tuesday three months ago. Your videos Evergreen. you could come back in a few years. That's the good thing about what you're doing. You could literally walk away today and forever your videos would still generate, yeah, generate. probably five to twelve thousand dollars a month. Yeah. If you just decide I'm I'm done. Five to twelve thousand dollars. Just a keep month. the channel doing, up, doing nothing. Bro. Oh, I'm I'm shocked how impressed you guys are with the analytics. It's just honestly. so consistent yeah. and it's surprising. Consistent. What surprised me also was that the top search term was your name, yeah. and I figured that the top search term would be like mansion. mansion tour, but people are searching for your name. I guess I I honestly haven't even looked at that. Yeah. I noticed that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your last and I, name. I, I have a tough last name to even you spell it, out. it right too yeah. yeah but here's the thing uh, YouTube auto recommends auto so oh. like every time I if you type in just Ennis yeah it automatically right, populates right. and everyone's like okay that's it yeah like if you do E-N-E like we're already up there you that's know? awesome what was my recommendation to you for, for the channel name because you asked me about this I did so uh, I forget what I told you so you were like look your name is tough you're like I would consider something that's a little bit easier to remember or like something that like you read it and it kind of would make sense, like something like Mansion Tours. Who, like you were like, this isn't the ideal scenario. And Mikey was kind of on the same boat. And my thing was like, and I still believe that concept to this day. If content is good, people don't care about anything else. Like content has to be good. And my thing was like, my name is so odd, but I have a very simple first name. People will just like remember it. Like it'll be all right. And my problem with these like mansion tours or these things, as soon as you put like these generic names, it becomes like a, almost like a TV show. I wanted 
to be about me in a sense of like a personality from there we'll build a different channel it's like we started ns plus and the logic behind ns plus was like it has just enough connotation that it has to do with me but it's plus it's everything else it's the team it's the vlogs it's us touring the rv it's mikey being on camera it's like featuring other people down the road so I knew that model would work and I just kind of stick to my guns. I was like, if you want to build a name to scale and then do businesses and uh, endorsements and that kind of stuff, it has to be on the name. So I just kind of stuck with it. Oh, it's worked. I think, I think my recommendation would have been to, to shorten your last name yeah, or do something that would be easier to spell. That way people just type in Anna because your first name easy. Easy. Yeah. And a lot of people yeah. just call my first name and yeah. even if, like, I'm not one of those people, if they can call it wrong. Like I have no problem with yeah. that. We should talk a little bit more about your past because I heard, yeah. yeah, what did you do before you did these mansion tours and real estate work? Um, so born and raised in Turkey, age of 17, moved to Texas, got a scholarship at Texas A&M. Um, when I moved to U.S., couldn't speak a word of English. Like I would have to grab other Turkish kids, be like, talk to the teacher. This is what I need. Like I sucked at it. Um, it was super lonely. Like my first two years in the U.S. is like no friendships. Mm -hmm. Like I sucked at the language. And then um, graduated from Texas A&M at the age of 22. At the time, applied for a green card because I was between the ages of 13 to 26. I was a professional windsurfer for 12 years. Seven sponsors traveled across the country, uh, around the world, over 35 countries. I was flying 200 thousand miles a year wow another cool fact i was sponsored by turkish airlines for seven years for seven years straight i flew nothing but bus uh, business class wow. everywhere around the world and i had 200 kilos so that's like about i had 900 pounds worth of free luggage allowance for me to carry all my windsurfing gear around the world i had the weirdest life that is like that's like a dream if yeah. you're 22 years did, old yeah did that get the ladies like I'm a professional windsurfer. You know what? Yeah. I was never the craziest or like the best about ladies. I was. I feel like you would be like the ultimate bachelor. You know, like the most suave, sweet talking. <laughs> you know, that really evolved after like 23, 24. Uh, I really found my way <laughs> in. I was like, oh, this is it's actually pretty easy. Uh, I just have to say the right things, yeah. kind of thing. I was honestly workaholic my whole life. Right. Like when I was windsurfing, I was practicing 12, 14 hours a day. Like. I, I just enjoy working. I just love improving. I love progress. Mm. I'm addicted to progress. It like progress turns me on. It's like, tell me a way to make things better. Let's talk. Like it's, I'm excited about, I don't know what it is. It's not even like we need that much progress. Um, but windsurfing career shaped really who I am. Work ethic is such an abusive sport. Like I'm so used to competing in like tough conditions. I always tell, now we wear suits, <laughs> shoots home. Like, what are you talking? Yeah. I sit on a desk all day, talk to people like, this is easy, like easy. So um, windsurfing really shaped who I am. Got me a green card. I have EB1, Extraordinary Ability Green Card. That's how I became a US citizen. In fact, I'm currently in my application right now to like, get my password, like fully become yeah. a U.S. citizen. Funny, my dad has the same thing. He's really? Canadian. He's Canadian. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Extraordinary awesome. ability? Yeah, they call it EB1. Yeah. So you EB1 prove the U.S. government that whatever profession you're in, you're in the top 5%. I had three world titles in windsurfing. Yeah. Three my world. Dad, so that means you were the best windsurfer in the world. In the world, yeah. yeah for three years. <laughs> wow. So that really shaped who I am. And age of 21 in Texas, mm -hmm. right after like the 2008 crisis, I saved up quite a bit of money. I bought myself a house and it was a flip that the owners couldn't finish. It was like 85% done. And it was like 200,000, no, it was $170,000. I spent all my savings on it. I was really frugal. I was kind of like mm -hmm. you. And I bought this house. I was like, oh my God, I have to finish the remaining because I have no money left. And me and my dad for 40 days straight fixed up the house. It was the greatest 40 days of my life. I was like, Whatever, whenever windsurfing ends, real estate is my next path. And any money I made from windsurfing, I started buying land. Any off time I had, I was at project sites, learning about real estate, uh, talking to developers. I became addicted with it. Over the course of between 2011 to 2018, I bought over 40 pieces of land in Texas, which I still own. To this day, I invested all my money in land and I started getting involved with like people's projects. 
uh, development. And age of 26, right at when I turned 26, I retired from windsurfing and I went in all in on flipping properties. Like I'm talking about construction belt on, running crews, 12 to 16 hours a day, hands-on building. Thus where my knowledge from uh, about homes comes from. Mm -hmm. Like I learned how to sewer line an entire house. I learned how to run water lines and water heater from the city tap to water heater to distributing to fixtures. I learned how to plumb an entire house by myself. I, le I learned how to frame additions. I can literally genuinely build a house from ground up. I have every skill set, wiring an entire room, running panels, troubleshooting, installing fixtures, roofing, standing seam metal roofs, uh, building block, uh, laying brick. I learned it all. And that gave me such a, it was such an humbling experience. Like imagine you're at age of 26, you were a three-time world champion in windsurfer, sponsored by Turkish Airlines, making really good money for, for that kind of job. How much were you, could you say? I was making around like $200,000 a year, which that's, is a lot. A that's, lot that's, of, that's more than I thought. That's geez. a lot. And I quit that just so like, Literally, I had this moment. I have to tell you guys this story. I took on this like huge project. This house was partially burned down. No one wanted to buy it. I was crazy enough to be like, I'll finish this. It's one of my biggest flips. I got a plumbing bit to do the sewer line and water line. It was $14,000. I was like, you're kidding, right? He's like, yeah, dude, this is my rate. I was like, okay, I know, do, I know how to do all this. This is an insane project to manage. I can run the cruise. Generally, I have about eight to 12 guys at the house at a time, and I can on the side do this myself over a two-week period since I know how to do it. I had to do PEX lines and PVC sewer line the whole place because it was an old home. It was all cast iron, mm. and it was a pier and beam home, so it was about two feet above the ground. I remember this moment. It's like 10 p.m. at night because I'm behind, so I catch up working late, and I'm replacing a sewer line and literally partial sewer was like sitting and it like leaked all over my mm -hmm. body i'm like what are you doing dude like you're you have money like you're like but when i put my mind into something i get so dedicated mm -hmm. i've sewer lined the entire house myself and it cost wow. me 1200 in material i saved like twelve thousand bucks while running the crew because material cost was nothing it was all labor and that's that's worth it then it, oh. it was worth it but like that kind of humbling experience. So now I go into these houses and I talk about them. It's not like I have a fluff language. I genuinely know. Like, so that gave me, like our channel's core knowledge comes from the fact that I ate shit for like last two to three years, flipping homes. I flipped, I mean, the amount of concrete I broke with a jackhammer with my own hands, it's gotta be over like 20,000 square feet. Wow. I'm not joking. So. That three intense years of like nonstop work and flipping homes gave, gave me a huge upside in like knowledge and understanding flips and understanding developments. So when I came to LA, when I started touring these homes, I would meet with developers. I would make like four or five comments. They're like, who are you? How do you know these things? I would come in, I'll be like right in the center of your uh, living room. You have a half inch step. He's like, no, I don't. I was like, put the laser up. I was like, I leveled so many homes. I was like, you have a half inch dip right there. They will put a level up. It would be like half inch to three quarters. They're like, holy crap. I'll be like, I told you. You have no idea how many foundations I corrected in Texas. So it's weird backgrounds all accumulated to this point with the YouTube channel. Do you share that on your, your channel? Never. Why not? Um, Let's do it on the second channel. Eventually we'll do it on the second channel. Like... It's, it's fun to talk about it when people ask, but it just, like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of a guy that's like, we'll just do good work, and then people will recognize it. I, I like staying low-key yeah. like that. Where did you get that work ethic from? Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm really competitive. And it's not like a competitive of, like, I'm going to beat this guy. I just don't know how to stop. Like, when I was flipping homes, um, more than half the homes I flipped, still to this day, no one has beaten those prices. Like I tell this all the time, I get appraisers call me to this day. They're like, how the hell you sold this home for this price in this neighborhood? I've hacked the whole flipping procedure. I would go find like really nice cabinetry stores and buy their open boxes, have it in the inventory. When the right flip hits, I would put a thousand dollar vanity on a home that's $140,000. My homes were so standalone, so good that I broke every single neighborhood record that I was in. And uh, that just comes from the fact that I was like, I could have made money. I was like, I could make better. I can put a half a million dollar 
home cabinetry in a $200,000 home. And I love that challenge. Mm-hmm. And I love over giving the value. Same thing with these tours. We can get away with doing less, but we can do more. And did people see it? The best compliment is where your work speaks for you. So this kind of stuff, it's almost like, why don't we just shut up and do good work? And we just let the people dictate. What about growing up? Did you did your parents have a similar work ethic, or is this my just dad something? Is, my yeah. dad, my dad is one of the hardest working person, right. you know? and uh, like my dad will never complain about anything. Yeah. That's what I learned. Like, you know, like look at my hands. I have cut after cut building the van. Uh, just shut up and build it. Yeah. Like, I know how to do it. What am I going to do? Hire someone and like get a plan design? Yeah. I was like, okay, we work a lot. We're shooting all this content to get ahead. I'm like. If I can get my assistants to help me, Mikey will help me a little bit. I'll stay to like 11 or 12. We built the van. So it's just like, uh, you take pride in it. And I don't know, I'm just competitive and uh, I appreciate progress. Yeah. This van that you're building, you want to yeah. talk a little bit about oh, that? Oh yeah, because explain the van. You're stopping here on a trip, yes. right? Yeah, so this has been me and Mikey's goal for a while that like we want to drive across the country and like shoot cool content, especially now that we have the second channel where we can kind of shoot anything really. And then uh, Mikey, in fact, do you want to come out here? Like give your thoughts on this. So for those not aware, Mikey, you're the, uh, the voice and the, the camera behind the scenes. I love your little, sometimes you'll, you'll throw in like a little comment or Mikey, go get a close up of it. It's, it's this, it's this cool little catchphrase that, that people know you through your voice. So some people may have heard you, but they have no idea what you look like. So now it's, now here you are. Yeah. It's weird to have people like recognize my voice. I was telling you yesterday, I got an Uber a few weeks ago and, uh, they were listening to a song from our channel and, uh, I started talking to them and they're like, your voice sounds really familiar. Are you Ennis's cameraman? And I was like, this is weird. <laughs> like, this is bizarre. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, it's weird sitting in front of cameras now, though. Yeah. 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 But coming back to the trip question, yeah. we wanted to do this across the country trip. And flying is difficult. We got a ton of camera gear. And, like, we have so many different skill sets. I mean, we have this, like, $14,000 rad and jet board that we wanted to use it around the country. And then we wanted to shoot other stuff. We were like, well, we like our production to be high. So how are we going to carry all this stuff? We were like, let's rent a Suburban. But that doesn't solve it. We have so much stuff with us. And then us. we need, like, a trailer, too. You yeah, know? we were like, maybe we take, like, I was literally, I have an S-Class. I was like, maybe I sell my S-Class, get it, I escalate in a trailer. You know, because of my contractor background, I have two cars. So I have my regular business car, like my Mercedes. And then I have this transit van that like I was literally running my contracting business in Texas. I brought it to L.A. because I genuinely didn't know what I was going to do in L.A. Full of still with my construction tools. I was like, Ennis, stop delaying this, dude. This van is probably perfect. The problem is the cargo van. It's super loud. It's metal to metal. Um, So we spent... Probably 100 hours roughly, first demoing the whole thing, rebuilding the decking, installing a backseat so the rest of the team can ride with us, putting this metal rack, like a garage shelf rack, and retrofitting it into the van, sound dampening the whole thing, uh, you know, covering the inside with a foam. So it's this sick now travel production van that we built. And we literally have all of our camera gear. We can ride up to five people. Also, it's it's a good starting point because it'll get better. But it's like over time, the van will improve and improve and improve. Mm-hmm. Slightly adjust. Uh, right, na- right now, it's like stage one of the van. Yeah. It's like yeah. the you, van's first life. You yeah. got to get something on the side of it. Something is a joke. It's just like, I think a plumbing company or like something like, a, like a that. A Doge logo? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Doge. my God. Doge yeah. would be cool. on the back. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. On our way to the moon. Yeah. yeah something like that. Yeah. 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 To uh, the moon. This would be nice. The moon. Yeah. Yeah. Total to the moon. Yeah. Um. So that's the story behind it. I, I think people like our friendship between me and Mikey. They like that we're not a big shot. Like I and I wear a suit because I respect my job and I I address what I'm about to say appropriately to the house. You're touring a fifty million dollar home, you better put a suit on that is sharp. You need to own up to that job and you need to deliver the information in the right way. This is not something to be joked about. Mm-hmm. So I think people respect how we carry ourselves a lot. And we get these comments so many times. Uh, Literally our last week's video, someone made a comment. It's like one of the most popular comments underneath Ryan Serhan's comment. We toured this home that Ryan toured. Ryan comment was like, I quit. Because (laughs) the views they've gotten in two weeks, we've gotten in less than one day. 
and we just passed by them. Yeah. And the second comment was like, let's talk about something that is unsp unspoken. These guys and NS started this trend of like detail walkthroughs and everybody else pretty much copied it. Yeah. yeah. Like, and it had like the most liked comment. Well, so yeah, just to clarify, like there was a few people out there filming homes. Yeah. But they're like, this is a view, you know? Or like, yeah. Yeah. this is a hundred like, million dollar home and it's like two like, yeah. fast have, shots, yeah. it's like but eight minute video of a, like, this yeah. is where the kitchen is. But you know what's is. interesting is yeah. that Ryan Serhantz is more about him and his personality. Yeah. yeah. Less about the house. Uh, producer Michael, I feel like it's more about what he's going to say and yeah. what he's wearing uh, and his watch. <laughs> than it is about the house. The house is more of a backdrop yeah, and you more watch more from Michael. Stuff, yeah. With yours, you really focus on the property. And by doing that, we actually have more personality in my yeah. opinion because we set ourselves so distinctly apart yeah. and kind of goes back to like, good luck copying it. Yeah. I, I genuinely look forward to someone tackling a, cha a challenge as big as what we tackled on a weekly basis and try to truly compete with us at both on knowledge and production. Uh, I've been a three-time world champion wind surfer. I tackle a lot of big challenges. This is without a doubt one of the most difficult things we've ever had to work around and like truly run it and figure out a way to do yeah. it efficiently. It's refreshing to hear you, Jack, like how you get it, right? Like being around Graham or being able to work with him and learn and observe and do stuff around Graham would be opportunity of a lifetime. I will do it in a heartbeat. And you know, when we were hiring, I'm like, I would kill to be around people like me, people like Mikey. Um, I want to tell this story, how I got into LA, which is really interesting. I think you will get a really good kick out of it. So I started flipping homes in Texas, quit being a windsurfer. And anytime I could see like three, four days of like opening where I could take a vacation, I was obsessed with million dollar listing. I watched every episode. This is not a joke. Me too. More than 20, 30 times. Like I'm not joking. Mm -hmm. And I was just obsessed with LA. I don't know what it is. It's like the architecture, the fanciness. You know, million dollar listing made it look really good. They glamorized. Now it, that yeah. I'm in it, oh my god, it's totally the opposite. Um, it's like it's almost funny. I remember you were kind of heartbroken when you realized how fake that show was or how produced oh, it was. Oh, heartbroken you know? is yeah. is understating. Yeah. I thought the two agents would really meet each other in the car off of the freeway, <laughs> side by side. Negotiating back and forth, rolling down the window. Like I thought cops, that's what yeah. it was like. Yeah. Throwing offers back Now you and see forth. these mean emails. You're like, we need a response by 12 p.m. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I would come to L.A. Not knowing, not knowing a single person. I will just drive around, look at properties. I would just hope for a glimpse of like inspiration or like something that I'm like, that's my end. Right. So my third time coming to L.A., literally coming and just like driving around. I didn't even have friends here. I was following literally everyone on Million Dollar Listing and like anybody that I sh saw on the show or a big list uh, agent in LA. And I was following Sam Real. And I, I know mm -hmm. you know Sam, right? Yep. I booked this ticket three months in advance to go to LA. And it was the night I was packing. The next day I was going to leave to LA. And Sam made a post on Instagram. He's like, I'm going to pick two of you guys to come and shadow me for a day. All you have to do is follow me. You know, like leave a comment and share my post, something like that, like something random where he was trying to grow his audience. I was like, wow, what an opportunity. I was like, I would kill to hang out with this guy. Then, of course, I've, I've like made the comment and shared and all that. And like within an hour, he had like 150 people. Yeah. I was like, I'm not going to win this. I was like, what can I do to win this? I was obsessed. I was like, this is opportunity is killer. And I really want to give Sam credit for this because Sam is the reason I made my move to LA quicker than I normally would have. Um, so I was like, I grabbed my camera last minute. I landed in LA. I, I landed to LA around like 3 a.m. the next morning. I slept like two hours. I went up to Hollywood Hills, put my tripod, set the camera. I had like a really nice view. Not knowingly, I had two of Sam's listings right behind me on that backdrop. I didn't even knew it. Wow. His two upcoming listings. And I shot bunch of takes on like who I am, what I do, why he should chose me, how much like this really means to me. I went down to Beverly Hills, edited it all day, and I made him a 10 minute reel of who I am, why he should chose me. And I was like, I was like, I'm just going to drop it off at Nest Seekers. I went there. I'm like, what if he doesn't see it? Like this would kill me. I spent, I was there for like three days. I burned my first full day trying to make this video. I was like, I'm just going to dress nice and go there be like, I'm a client. I want to talk to Sam Riel. So I went over there, like, I'm like, can I talk to Sam? They're like, wait a minute. And his assistant at the time uh, uh, came down, which I'm really good friends with now. And he was like, hey, man, what's up? How can I help you? I'm like, dude, 
this is embarrassing. I really wanted to uh, win this um, giveaway and I made this video. I'm so afraid he may not see it. Uh, but now that I know you're having it, can you show it to him? Like, I really want to win this. He goes, you made a video for that Instagram post? He's like, I made that post as a, like, fine, like, Will Grove said, you made a full video? I'm like, yeah, like, I spent the whole day on it. It's really good. Like, please make sure Sam sees it. He goes, no, 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 no. He's like, Sam is coming in an hour. You want to pitch it in person? Mm -hmm. So, hour later, mm -hmm. I'm in the office with Sam, and uh, Sam is like, you made, like, he curses a lot in a good way. He's like, you made a video? I'm like, dude, this would mean a lot that, like, I'm trying to, like, figure out my way to L.A. He's like, you're nuts. He watched the video. He couldn't yeah. stop smiling the whole time. He goes, he, he goes, what are you doing tonight? I was like, I don't. And you know what? I have such gut, gut instincts. I brought a suit with me. I was like, I'm going to make this work. Like, this is going to work. I knew it. I brought a suit with me. He goes, million dollar listing season eight premiere party is tonight you want to meet the whole cast he's like i'm going to take you that very night i met sam sam took me to million dollar listing los angeles party i met josh i met everybody i'm like oh my god how did this happen in the last 24 hours this is insane right there i was like this is the city you need to be in your craziness works here you can pull it does stuff. like it works these like ideas of like almost of like you're ridiculous actually works in LA after hanging out that night it was like I couldn't believe the whole night I was so happy I have a photo with Sam if you go to my Instagram you can full, pull the photo uh, and then Sam was like he's like screw uh, shadowing me for a day he goes what are you doing in December he's like why don't I give you a desk here I went back home, Texas I worked nonstop for like 50 days finished two of my flips I came uh, to LA in December, this is like three years ago, and I spent two full weeks helping Sam out, mm. running errands with him for free, and it was the greatest two weeks I've ever spent. And at that point, it clicked me. I was like, if these are if these agents can make it in LA, I'll figure it out. I went back to LA. I went back to Texas. Five months. I sold my home. I finished the other couple projects I had. I had done like. 15 garage sales. I liquidated my whole life and what I built in Texas in the last nine years. I packed my van to the grim with my construction tools, my desk, and my TV. I Te shipped my technically Mercedes. Technically, I packed your van. And then literally Mikey yeah. helped me packing that van. Like, not a joke. Mm -hmm. Like, he was the last person I saw packing the van, and I moved to LA. And that's the story. So... Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to say this because like partially I'm bummed out with a new generation and like how little initiative they take. It's kind of refreshing to hear Jack and how he understands the opportunity yeah. and sees so, it so and respects it. But, so, but did you do Sam's laundry? I have not done Sam's laundry. Would but you I, have? <laughs> without, in a heartbeat. Without a doubt, in a heartbeat. Yeah. It's, it's but not see, a But here's the thing. Jack, this did is, you do Graham's no. laundry? No, but I would have. Okay, cool. In a heartbeat. Here's, here's the thing. Um, it, that's unspoken. I mean, you don't have to be told to do Sam's laundry. You would have just done it. And I think that's a quality that you can't ask of somebody. It's just, it's already there. Yeah. So that, that Jack and I made the mistake of saying like, we want these qualities in somebody to be willing to do this. And everyone said, I can't believe you would, you would assume that I would do lot. But, but that's, that's the sort of stuff you, you can't describe. Graham is referencing when we were going through the hiring. So, yeah, so, yeah, we we got so Ennis and I are hiring Mike an assistant saved. for, for the channel. Like I need an assistant editor. Yeah. We saw your, we saw your video yeah. and how you found, um, Alex, Alex. Yeah. And we were like, this is great. Let's do this exact same thing. You know? So even in the video, we're like, we're yeah. copying Graham. Yeah. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we like say that, um, we film the whole thing. We like we like do it in one take. All our requirements we like wrote down bullet points. You know what we're paying, all this stuff. We like we put were it inspired out there. by you guys. Yeah, and and uh, it's we're starting to get the submissions now, but it really didn't work out as well as it did for you. Number one, I think because our channel is not as personality based. It's more about the houses. People don't know us that well. You know, yeah. we don't have as as big of a core audience. You know, and it was a smaller position. It's basically we were looking for a paid intern. Really, yeah. Maybe yeah. we had a bad but way of articulating it. We we didn't articulate it well enough, and we really got destroyed on how much we were paying. You know, it's like how much are you paying? Fifteen dollars well, we like an hour. Fifteen dollars an hour, but we're looking for like an eighteen, nineteen year old kid who lives with his parents who like wants to learn how to edit or something. Right. Like that. You can't describe that. That's what Jack and I learned. You can't describe. We were we were saying like you got to be willing to like do laundry, pick up Bailey's poop. It's like yeah. And Jack was like, it's not going to be glamorous by any means. Graham, and I agree it, yeah. and disagree with you. Yeah. 
I thought it was smart. And I'm like, <laughs> you, you, you know why? Because yeah. you guys need that person that has care. You guys are a lean and mean team. And that person cannot be like, okay, I'm going to come in and put 50 hours. No, like you guys needed that edge. Yes, you guys might have gone bash on the comments. But realistically, that's the person you guys are looking for. You guys were just brutally yeah. honest. And yeah. if they have a problem, I mean, this is a, such an amazing group of team of people to be around. You guys are literally moving and shaking things. You all yeah, got some great submissions that I watched like 15 or 20. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we recommend that if, by the way, if you're watching this, if you're looking to hire anybody, type in Graham Stephan interview, go down the list of people who uh, applied video. And, and poach those people. Yeah. Because I want to say we had five or six you guys get, got some good submissions. That, mm -hmm. that we wanted to hire. It's just, we could, I mean, obviously we could only pick one. And there are so many other variables of just like, we would feel bad if you quit. Like there were people making like six figures who were willing to quit their job and yeah. move across the country to do Jack's Laundry and pick up base. And we're just like, we would feel bad if that yeah. didn't work out because that's too big of a risk. Or, you know, moving a big family across the country. It's like stuff like that. It was it was tough. It yeah. was tough. But there yeah. are people in there, in that list, who like, in the future, we're going to go back through that list. And Amazing. I think we're going to pick that. Yeah, we're going to pick more people. Yeah, and another thing we're working on, we're partnered up with two companies so far. One of them is Top Hap. It's a real estate database uh, analytics platform. Basically, you know how we in, in real estate look at like 20 different websites to gather all the information? Yeah. It's a one website gathers all that information, puts it into a beautiful interface. You can look at how loud a neighborhood is or like how many people in your neighborhood has a pool and when they pull their permit to getting AI to give you a calculated um, comparables, price um, per square foot, tax analysis, so many other aspects. A mind-blowing amount of data points. Mind-blowing. And the, their point was like, let's say you want to invest in a certain part of California without leaving your home in an hour or two, looking at the right databases, you should be able to educate yourself as good as a realtor who works in that field. And then you can simply go back and then make your decisions accordingly. Yeah. It's a really efficient, kind of like an investing in a database platform in regards to real estate. And the second company we're working with is Picasso. So that's a really unique concept. A lot of people associate that with timeshare, but they go and they buy the property they stage the whole thing. They fix anything that needs to be done. And then from there, they set up the management LLC on it, uh, put the property manager, maintenance, and all that stuff. And they divide it to one-fourth or one-eighth of ownerships. So you say you buy to one-fourth. Quarter of the time over a year, you own uh, the staying rights in the property. They have a beautiful app. They, you go in. You type in the dates you want, like a hotel. They book the place for you. Everything is ready when you come in. And you own uh, one-fourth of the home. So as the property uh, uh, appreciates, you get the upside on that. They can finance it for you. They handle all the transactions. You can use a realtor of your choice to sell it. Mm. And they were just evaluated at $1 billion. The and fastest awesome. to get to a billion, right? Yeah, one of the fastest companies to get to a billion dollar evaluation. Uh, Co-founders of Dot Loop and Zillow is back in the company. Um, so it's a pretty exciting project for us. It's us and the Altman brothers mm -hmm. that That's are cool. kind of like the brand uh, partners, brand ambassadors for the company. So That's yeah. very cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We're really excited yeah. about it. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much both for coming here. This has been a really fun episode. I thank really you for enjoyed this. hearing some of your stories. I had no idea from some of this. So it's really cool hearing this from you. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank you for having us. I can't imagine uh, when we jumped on that open house when you were there. Like it would two years ago that yeah. we would be on your podcast two years from now. You know? no, it's pretty to crazy. Show you a lot could happen in, uh, what, two years? Two yeah. years. Two be years. sure to watch watch Graham's YouTube course. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And that's right. $200 off for the next seven days. And, it's, then, and then it's done. That's it. It's well and worth it. mentorship group. And subscribe to the channel. And smash the like button. <laughs> Bye. Jesus. We're good. No worries. <laughs> Yeah, I'm probably moving it, right? <laughs> I'm so used to moving in the videos.